Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing cardiac muscle contraction. Okay, so so far we've seen that uh, when an action potential arrives at the plasma membrane, it causes these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels to open. These are going to allow calcium to move in from the extracellular space into the uh, cytoplasm, and it's going to go into these dyadic clefts, basically. And now that calcium signal, which is known as a calcium sparklet, is going to trigger release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So let's have a look at how. Well, basically, if we draw the plasma membrane here, so this is the sarcolemma, we'll call it. Remember, the sarcolemma is just this fancy name for um, the cell membrane in the case of a smooth, uh, in the case of a muscle cell. So we've taken this piece of plasma membrane out here, and I've rotated it round 90 degrees so that we can draw it nicely down here. Okay. Then we've got the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum here, and this gap between the two, I said, was called the dyadic cleft. Okay. And this whole structure is known as a calcium synapse. So what's going to happen is the calcium is going to come in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, or these dihydropyridine receptors, which I'll just draw like that. So the calcium is coming in through this dihydropyridine receptor here. And what it's going to do is it's going to activate a massive, and I mean a massive, great protein here. Okay, so let's discuss this massive, great protein. This massive, great protein is a protein known as type 2 ryanodine receptor. Okay, right, so that deserves its name writing down, and it is a massive protein. So this is type 2, type 2, and we'll do its name in Roman numerals because it's so important, ryanodine receptors. Well, this is a type 2 ryanodine receptor. And a type 2 ryanodine receptor is often abbreviated to RY for ryanodine, R for receptor, and then you put 2 afterwards for the second type. Okay, now, there are three genes in the human genome which code for ryanodine receptors. The type 1 gene, the type 2 gene, and the type 3 gene. You can only form... Uh, well, actually, firstly, let me just tell you, the ryanodine receptor is a tetramer. It's made up of four ryanodine proteins, so here in blue is a quarter of the ryanodine receptor, but it's a single ryanodine protein. Now, there are three genes for ryanodine proteins, the type 1, type 2, and type 3 gene. Now, when you form a ryanodine receptor, you can only, and this is lovely because we know how complicated voltage-gated potassium channels are, you can only form homotetramers. You can only make them out of four proteins which are encoded for by the same gene. So when I say this is a type 2 ryanodine receptor, what I mean is that you have gone to the type 2 ryanodine protein gene, you have made four proteins from that gene, and you have stuck them together to get a type 2 ryanodine receptor. Okay, now another fun fact about the ryanodine protein is that they are absolutely massive. These proteins are approximately um, 4,000, I think, amino acids in length. So they are absolutely massive great proteins. So amino acid length, 4,000, and we are putting four of these things together to get our overall ryanodine protein. So it is massive, basic, uh, sorry, sorry, to get our overall ryanodine receptor. So it's a massive great protein. These things are visible, basically, when you do electron microscopy. Okay, so what happens now? Well, basically, the calcium is going to come and bind to this uh, type 2 ryanodine receptor here, and it's going to cause that type 2 ryanodine receptor to open, and the type 2 ryanodine receptor will start releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, this phenomenon of calcium inducing calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is known as calcium-induced 
calcium release. Okay, because the calcium that you've cut that has come in from the extracellular space through the type uh, L-type uh, voltage-gated calcium channels is inducing the release of uh, calcium-induced. Oh, whoops! Is inducing the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is calcium-induced calcium release, and that's often abbreviated to kicker. Kicker. Okay, so uh, calcium-induced calcium release. Okay, right. Now, a little bit more fact for you. Basically, the way that these type 2 ranadine receptors uh, release calcium so quickly is that they are associated with proteins which have got calcium bound to them. Well, actually, they're associated with proteins which are associated with another protein which has calcium bound to it. So, there's basically a complex of proteins nearby these type 2 ranadine receptors. Okay, so let's draw some of these down here. So, uh, let's draw a protein here, okay? And uh, let's draw another one here. So, there are two proteins that complex with the type 2 ranadine receptor. And then these two proteins bind to another protein, which then binds to calcium. So, what are the names of these two proteins? Well, one is a protein known as junctin, okay, J-U-N-C-T-I-N. And then the other one, which I'll put here, is known as triadin. So this is triadin. Okay, right. Uh, so let's colour these two proteins in. So we'll have uh, triadin, not in violent purple, we'll have it in red. We've used um, vivid purple too many times today. Well, too many times on this page. So here is our triadin protein in red. Okay. And in turquoise, shall we have? We'll have the junctin protein in turquoise. Okay. Right. Now, these two proteins associate with another protein, which we'll have here. Okay. So both of them associate with another protein. And this other protein is known as cal sequestrin. So let me write this nice and clearly. Calcequestrin. Okay. And uh, calcequestrin is often abbreviated to CSQ. So often you will hear people, oh, whoops, not C8. Uh, cross that out. CSQ. Okay, let me get rid of that. So calcequestrin. So um, this calcequestrin, which we'll outline in blue here, this is the protein which now binds to calcium. So this has calcium bound to it. So the type 2 ranadine receptor is associated with these two proteins, junctin and triadin, which are associated with calcequestrin, and calcequestrin is associated with calcium. So there's lots of calcium very near this type 2 ranadine receptor. So when the type 2 ranadine receptor opens, you get calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. Now, this new calcium signal, this calcium signal that's coming out of the uh, type 2 ranadine receptors here, this is known as a calcium spark. So the rise in calcium around a type 2 ranadine receptor is known as a calcium spark. Now, when the calcium is released from the type 2 ranadine receptor, it means that the calcium is going to go up in the cytoplasm, but down nearby uh, the uh, type 2 ranadine receptor in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's going to go down here. And the reduction in calcium on the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum luminal side is what's known as a calcium scrap. Okay, And basically, that's just... Uh, spark spelled almost backwards. So if you imagine taking these four letters here, the park bit of spark, and then doing them backwards, you get scrap. So that's where uh, calcium scrap came from. Okay, uh, and that's the reduction in calcium that happens in the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum lumen due to the calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into uh, the cytoplasm of uh, the muscle cell. Right, okay, so it's these calcium sparks now that are going to all sum together 
to produce a rise in calcium, a global rise in calcium in the cardiomyocyte cytoplasm, which is then going to lead to contraction in that cardiomyocyte. Okay, so you're going to have this happening at every single one of these of these calcium synapses, and that's going to result in a lot of calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, enough now to drive the cardiomyocyte into contraction. Now, how is this different in ventricular and uh, sorry in atrial myocytes? Because we've discussed ventricular myocytes where you have these T tubules, uh, and therefore you have lots of these calcium synapses. Okay, in atria you don't have the T tubules. So instead, if we um, uh, if we draw an atrial, in fact, let's get another piece of paper. Okay, if we draw an atrial. Um, cell here, so an atrial myocyte here. So this is an atrial myocyte. Okay, so the action potential will now propagate along the cell membrane. Well, it will propagate more like this, basically, on both sides. Okay, and what you'll have is you'll have absolutely loads of these calcium synapses, basically, at the cell membrane. So you'll have loads of calcium synapses at the cell membrane. So this organelle that I'm drawing now this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you've got many calcium synapses with the plasma membrane. Now you don't have them. You don't have invaginations of the sarcoplasmic, um, uh, sorry, of the sarcolemma into the cytoplasm. So yes, all of these calcium synapses will be at the plasma membrane. Now what this means is that all of the calcium sparks are going to be at the plasma membrane. Remember, the calcium spark was the rise in intracellular calcium that you got when a type 2 ryanodine receptor uh, released the calcium. Okay, So, you're going to get a rise in calcium that is peripheral in the cell. So, if we draw with this green highlighter where calcium is going to go up, you're going to get calcium going up around the edge of the cell, i.e. you're only going to get calcium going up um, near the edges. Okay, And this is the point of the T-tubule system in ventricular myocytes and indeed in skeletal myocytes. It's to ensure that the calcium signal, that, these, uh, that the rise in calcium gets into the deep depths of the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, but this isn't going to happen in the case of the atrial myocytes. You're going to only get it around the edge, and that's going to mean that initially you get a very feeble contraction of atrial myocytes. Now, what can happen is uh, when you stimulate atrial myocytes with beta agonists, okay, beta adrenergic agonists. So, for instance, adrenaline. When adrenaline stimulates the cell, and we will have a whole video on uh, the response to um, beta-1 agonists such as adrenaline. But for now, uh, let it suffice to say that when you stimulate it with noradrenaline, when you suddenly need the heart to start beating faster because you're in a fight or flight situation, then the calcium signal propagates into the entire cell. And the reason for that is that all of these calcium sparklets that were allowed in, uh, sorry, these, all of the calcium signals that came in through the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels, those get bigger when you stimulate the cell with um, a, a beta-1 agonist. So let me draw something to show this. So if we have the plasma membrane here, effectively what you have is if we draw the sarcoplasmic reticulum, what you still have is the same structure as you had in, um, in the ventricular uh, myocyte. So you still have the sarcoplasmic reticulum in going deeper into the cytoplasm of the cell. So even though in this picture I drew it just at the cytoplasm because I just was interested in showing uh, calcium synapses at the cytoplasm, but in reality what will happen is this um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, it will, you know, it will form, it will go deeper into the cytoplasm and it will have loads of these sort of processes that are ready to form calcium synapses. Okay, so let me draw one here. Now, in response to beta-1 agonists such as noradrenaline or adrenaline, what will happen is the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel here, when it opens, 
it will have a greater conductance. So the beta-1 um, stimulation by adrenaline or noradrenaline is going to cause this voltage-gated calcium channel of the L-type here to increase its uh, function, basically. Okay, And we will go through how in a separate video. But it's going to increase its function, so it's going to allow in more calcium initially. Okay, So the calcium sparklet, as we called it, which was the calcium uh, that came in from the extracellular space through this um, L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, it's going to get bigger. Okay, So if I show this in green, let's say initially it was just like this. This was the calcium signal. This was high calcium level, shown by green. Maybe now it'll just happen to go like this. Okay, Now, when it spreads to these ones, what will happen? Those ones will also release calcium. Okay, So these will release calcium too. And when these release calcium, so these release calcium in a calcium spark, okay, it will propagate onto the next ones, and the calcium from these calcium sparks here will activate these processes here, will activate the type 2 ranadine receptors here, and those will release calcium, and then the calcium from here will go and activate the um, type 2 ranadine receptors from uh, further along. So you will get this sort of conduction of the release of calcium, where the release of calcium from one bit of the endoplasmic reticulum causes the release from further, um, from more bits, from the bit from its neighbours, basically, and then its neighbours cause the release of calcium from their neighbours, etc. And it's really what's known as saltatory conduction. So saltatory conduction does not just refer to conduction uh, of an action potential along a membrane. Saltatory conduction really refers to any process where something happening here causes the same thing to happen here, that causes it to happen here, and it just propagates forward like that. This is saltatory conduction, where calcium release here induces calcium release here, induces calcium release here. Uh, so any sort of process like that is referred to as saltatory conduction. So if you get, if you stimulate atrial myocytes with beta-1 agonists, such as adrenaline and noradrenaline, you can induce saltatory conduction of the calcium-induced calcium release, uh, and that can cause calcium to go up in the entire uh, atrial myocyte, even though it doesn't have T-tubules. Okay. Right, so in the next video what we'll look at is how a calcium signal can actually lead to contraction of the cardiomyocyte.